Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. How are you? Thank you very much for joining. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I think that um, most people had the opportunity to meet, but I think that uh, just for com comprehensiveness, uh, just uh, uh, Peter, just uh, just a quick warm thank you very much for once again joining and, and bringing us all together. Um, I think that there's various stakeholders, guests, um, but obviously one of the the main individuals for, for today, other than the pediatric specialists and the oncology teams, um, is obviously Her Royal Highness Dina. So, um, Her Royal Highness, just uh, from all of us, a very big special thanks. We really appreciate you joining. Um, and then obviously to, to all of our speakers from CHOC, I think mean that today is a very special day, very important day. Um, and obviously we need a highlight early warning signs, early detection, awareness, and obviously destigmatizing an environment which is absolutely imperative. So in advance, just from all of us, a special thanks. Um, just to let you all know that we're just starting to slowly let guests and uh, obviously those that are going to watch the webinar in. So we're just going to take a few minutes. So, uh, yeah, it's exciting times, but thank you very much. We are done on the thing. Mm, okay. Uh, Headley, a uh, quick one for you. So, so all everyone that speaks is it more a Q and A rather than people are going to make speeches? Yes, all conversation. Um, Peter, it's all conversational. All right. Okay. So just from the go get go, just having chats. Yeah, I think you can just go through. I'll read my meticulous notes throughout the yeah. the reigning order to, to assist us throughout. Okay.
Hello, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much indeed uh, for joining us uh, for this. Uh, Chalk Foundation Journey of Hope webinar, another one in the series of uh, webinars that uh, we will be having, and uh, I hope that you were part of the last one, but uh, I'm so excited about these conversations that we're able to have. So thanks so much for joining us, uh, if you're in this room now, live, and for those of you that might have clicked through another time, thanks for clicking through, and the reason that you're here perhaps is because this issue is very special to your heart, and uh, it's good to have people in the same room uh, with a common purpose. And it's all about helping our children, isn't it? And their families uh, get through a very difficult period in their lives. And so welcome to you. Thank you so much. 
we have some great speakers that are going to be chatting to us, uh, helping us with this conversation today. I'm going to say I'm very, very excited. We have a special guest that joined us uh, today as well. We're going to hear more about her a little bit later on. Her Royal Highness, Sir Princess Dina Muria, thank you so much indeed for giving us your time. I know that uh, you have a really busy schedule, but to be with us today, a great honor. And for all the other champions that are in the room that are going to be talking, thank you so much as well for uh, giving us your words uh, in this conversation and a very important conversation uh, that we're having uh, today on a very special day, uh, International uh, Childhood Cancer Day, but a little bit more on that again uh, later on. Uh, just to let you know, my name is Peter Ndoro. Um, a lot of people in this part of the world know me uh, for, for being the TV guy, but it's always a joy for me to be uh, involved in things beyond our normal stories, especially causes like this. Our children in particular, for me, always tugs at my heartstrings. And I'm sure that that's why uh, everybody's in this room right now. Uh, Chuck, uh, I've been working with them for a while now. And uh, just to let you know a bit more about them, if uh, this is the first time you've, you've heard about the foundation, uh, it's a nonprofit organization that advocates for uh, health and well being of children and teenagers uh, diagnosed with cancer or life threatening blood disorders uh, and their families, and it offers a comprehensive uh, child and family support through uh, psychosocial, emotional, and uh, practical support. Uh, uh, as uh, the foundation augments uh, different uh, medical fraternities. Now, it's uh, Chalk's mission to support children and teens uh, with cancer or life-threatening blood disorders and their families, improving, of course, the very important uh, uh, aspect of early detection and facilitating a treatment. And as I said, today is uh, Childhood Cancer Day, International Childhood Cancer Day. Um, and it's a day that uh, is a global collaborative campaign, I guess, uh, to raise awareness uh, about childhood cancer, celebrated each year uh, on the 15th of February. And uh, this is the 20th edition of uh, the ICCD. Uh, and under the theme this year, better survival is achievable, hashtag through your hands. And uh, as you know, and I think uh, I'm preaching to the converted here, every child, every teenager, and every parent who starts uh, the childhood cancer journey have hope that uh, their child will survive and live uh, a long and happy uh, life, a healthy life, uh, a very fulfilled life as well. And as a global childhood cancer community, we believe that uh, increased awareness, uh, accurate information, knowledge can empower all of us uh, to recognize the early warning signs that are so, so important to, of childhood cancer and able then to make informed choices about uh, children's health and counter fears and, and misconceptions about childhood cancer. So now during the whole cancer journey, there are many role players, uh, people that uh, play a key part uh, in that journey, parents, families who have hope and they entrust their children's uh, and children, uh, uh, teenagers uh, care hashtag through your hands uh, but who are these angels who are these champions that impact on childhood cancer uh, uh, the journeys and how uh, is their part uh, uh, how is their role a part of this journey and that's what we're going to explore a little bit today and we'll be paying tribute to, to them to the medical teams the healthcare workers and the multidisciplinary teams involved in uh, childhood cancer uh, journey uh, of hope. And uh, they'll also be sharing their positive uh, impact uh, that, uh, that has had on their lives uh, of children, adolescents uh, with cancer, but also their personal experiences of uh, these incredibly brave journeys uh, that our children and teens uh, have to go through. And uh, you'll get to know uh, the team, uh, where they fit in and how they impact on this journey. Uh, you'll be hearing their voices uh, during the course of this conversation. All right, uh, I can talk forever as you can hear, uh, that's my job <laughs> normally, uh, but today is really not about me, it's about those champions that uh, you'll be hearing voices from and for you that uh, are part of this conversation to hear. And we hope that at the end of this webinar, you'll have some valuable information, you'll feel enriched a little bit uh, by what we share on this platform. 
And it's my great pleasure now to welcome our first uh, guest to uh, share a few words with us. Uh, he's uh, the head of the, the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Unit at Steve Beaker Academic Hospital and Net Care Unitas. Uh, Professor uh, David Reinders uh, successfully completed his fellowship in stem cell transplants in England, manages the South African Children's Tumor Registry on behalf of the South African Childhood Cancer Study Group and serves on the Regional Committee of Chalk Northern Region. Prof, thanks so, so much indeed for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, yours is one of those jobs, I guess, that is heartbreaking at times, but most of the times uh, rewarding because you're bringing health and hope to so many of our children and teens. So thanks so much indeed for joining us uh, in conversation on this uh, uh, a special day. Sam, thank you very much for that, for that very kind introduction. It's a, it's a real a privilege to be here. All right, so share with us uh, a, a day in the life of uh, Prof. Dave Reinders in a pediatric oncology unit working uh, with children with cancer or life-threatening blood disorders? Yeah, so firstly, I'd, I'd like to start off by saying that, that I, I have possibly the most amazing profession. It, it really is, is, is such an honor to be part of the journey of families and children that are, that are going through this particularly difficult fight. Um, and, and on top of that, to, to witness and, and just experience these little fighters, these children that are so resilient and so positive, regardless of, of what they're going through. It, it is such, a, such an amazing experience. But my, my day typically starts off with coming into the hospital and, and doing ward rounds. That's where we'd go through and we'd have a look at patients to make sure that they're progressing like we would like them to. So children that are acutely ill from, from complications from treatment to make sure that our treatment is working and, and also um, patients that have received chemotherapy that their, their treatment is appropriate and things are going smoothly. Uh, then I sometimes will have the opportunity to do minor procedures that, that maybe need to be done on children. And then um, I have the opportunity to go and see patients in a more outpatient setting where I'll get to maybe see new patients, um, which, is, which is always reasonably difficult, or also um, get to follow up patients that have completed their treatment, which, which in itself is extremely rewarding because these are children that have completed treatment, are doing well and are thriving. So, so that's really a, 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 um, a tonic for the day. Then in the afternoon, Unlike the doctors on Gray's Anatomy, we, we have to do some admin and write letters and things like that. Um, so, so part of the time is, is spent doing that. And then after that, it's time to learn. Um, most malignancies don't read textbooks and they come up with, with new and interesting ways to present themselves. Um, and, and obviously, it, pediatric oncology is a rapidly evolving field. So, so one does need to try and stay abreast and ahead of things and make sure that the treatment that you're offering is the best treatment and the most up-to-date treatment and then it's bedtime <laughs> and then you get what uh, half an hour sleep and you start all over again <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, no. Um, I mean uh, look it, it, we talk to you and uh, people like you head these teams but it is a team effort isn't it and I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about those people around you that help you do the work that you do and uh, to help our children and our teens yeah, so, so it's impossible to, to function as, as an oncologist without a team around you. And, and um, so our, our team is, is made up of, of many different disciplines. Um, obviously, as, as I may have mentioned there, that we don't really treat the child, we treat the whole family. Um, so you need to have many skills involved. So our team would, would consist of, of, most importantly, I would say, is the nurses, um, we have practice managers and coordinators. Um, there's obviously a, a handful of doctors, um, dietitians, social workers, occupational therapists, um, and, and also the NGOs such as CHOC. They, they also essentially are, are part of the team. We, we, we meet once a week to have these, what we would refer to as a multidisciplinary team meeting. And at this meeting, we don't really focus necessarily on the on the, the clinical side, but, but rather on, on the holistic view of the patient, where we go through each patient that's receiving treatment in, in our service, and, and we discuss, are there any issues? Are there any social issues? Are there any other issues that we are maybe missing as clinicians? Because we often 
you know, look at a patient with, with blinkers on and only worry about the, the specific medical condition, but there's a much broader picture to, to a patient. And, and then with regard to the team, I, I would like to think that, that, that we actually function as a family where, where no person has a greater role to play than the other. So even if it's from the lady who's cleaning the surfaces to the doctor who's finally writing the prescription, we function as a, as a, as a family rather than, than just as a team. And, and I think the value of that is, is that we don't only look at the patient and their family, but we also look at one another. Um, obviously, oncology is a is a hard hard field to work in, and and sometimes things go go wrong, and it can be quite painful, and and people can, for want of a better word, start experiencing compassion fatigue or burnout. And it's nice to have a family around you, to essentially care for the carers. And and I think it's I'm privileged to to work in such an environment where there are so many people that care for one another and at the same time care for patients. So yeah. It's a team. It's a team effort and, and no one person is more important than the other. We're so grateful for the work uh, that you guys do. Um, and this is all about a journey of hope. And uh, the theme for International Childhood Cancer Day is uh, a better survival. And so I want to perhaps end with a thought from you uh, about and giving hope that uh, a over time treatments are getting better. Uh, um, survival rates are getting better, that there is hope and early detection really is the key, isn't it? Yeah, no, definitely. Early detection is, is, is essential to, to giving us a, a fair chance and, and improving our chance of survival. Um, with regard to, to you know, hope, um, the survival rates are improving almost on a, on a monthly or yearly basis based on new developments and new research that's, that's going on. And, and certainly it's, it's not a necessarily a sad story, child with childhood cancer. It's actually a positive and an exciting story and way more children survive and go on to become adults and, and, and fully functional people in society um, than don't. So I think it's, it's something that, that there is definitely hope and, and there is definitely a, a future for most children who, who have this horrible diagnosis. Professor Reinders, thank you so much indeed uh, for being one of our champions. Uh, keep on doing the good work that you do. Thank you so much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. And uh, closely uh, working with Professor Reinders is our next uh, guest. And uh, she's the practice manager, actually, for uh, Professor Reinders uh, in the uh, Pediatric Oncology Unit at uh, Netcare Unitas. And why we brought Sister Belinda Austin is that uh, this is somebody who uh, uh, really understands uh, childhood cancer all too well, being a, a long-term childhood cancer survivor herself. So Sister Belinda, thank you so much indeed for joining us and uh, sharing uh, your story with us uh, today. Um, you're a childhood cancer survivor, as I've just said, and you're the practice manager with the uh, Prof Reinders there at uh, 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 Netcare Unitas. Um, please share your journey with us that uh, brought you back to uh, pediatric oncology. Hi, Peter. Hi, everybody. Um, my journey started when I was in grade five, so probably about 11 years old, when I had a, um, discovered a lump in my neck. Um, luckily, um, everybody reacted very quickly and it was removed and it came back as a diagnosis of lymphoma. Um, I, was, I was treated um, with chemotherapy and I went through all the symptoms that you would think, you know, nausea and vomiting and everybody, everything tastes horrible, everything smells horrible, um, you're hungry but you're not hungry. Um, yes, so I went through all of that and that's something that I can, that I can definitely share with the patients that we treat. Um, I went on to do a nursing degree. I worked two years abroad um, in the UK where I mostly worked with um, palliative care patients. I came back to South Africa with the idea to work in ICU. You know, everybody wants to work in ICU. Um, my CV kind of got derailed and I ended up in the pediatric oncology unit and 18 years later, I'm still there. Um, and I love it. I complete, I, I, I live my, I work my passion every day. Um, it is, it's an amazing privilege to work with um, pediatric oncology patients. 
So do you think that uh, your experience of um, healthcare when you were so young maybe inspired you to become a, a healthcare professional? No, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that is, I always, I always said I want to become a doctor or I want to become a nurse. Um, and yes, that is what mm. I did. No, tell, I us a, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about uh, at this job, this, this work that you do. Um, I know that it's much more than maybe just taking a temperature perhaps uh, and administering medication. What's a typical day like uh, for you, particularly in the area of work that you're involved in? Um, a typical day is, is um, like you said, it's not just giving medication. It's not just taking a temperature. It is, it's a, actually a very emotional experience to work in a, um, in a pediatric oncology unit. It's filled with emotions. Sometimes it's laughter, sometimes sadness, sometimes anger, sometimes it's sometimes very difficult to get up, and I think Prof. Reinders will definitely agree with me, to get up and actually go to work because you don't know what you're going to find in that day. But the moment that little bald head child walks into that unit, um, it is it just changes because they mostly always have a smile on their face. And if they can face challenges like yeah. that, um, with a smile on their face, who am I to walk around with a a sad face yeah. and we're not just we're not just there we're not just treating the child we're treating every grandparent we're treating every parent we're treating siblings i mean it's it's a whole host of 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 individuals that need support um from all of us so i i would think that a day in the in, in an oncology ward is is mostly supporting supporting every every individual that walks through the door I can only imagine how personal it might be for you because you know what it's like to be that child and have so many questions and perhaps don't have the language or the understanding to know what's really going on and yet um, aware as well about that you're not well. Um, so it must be quite a thing for you uh, personally, having gone and been able to, to feel and experience what our children and teens are going through. Yes, I think I think a lot of people in life, you, 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 you want to look for your purpose in life. And a lot of people go through life without finding their purpose in life. And um, I think I, I work and I live my purpose every day. Um, to be able to support every child there is, um, is just amazing. Wow, thank you so, so much. Um, yeah. Thank you for being uh, a, a great champion uh, and doing the work that you do. Uh, never tire doing good, I once was told. And so we, it's so good to see people like you championing and helping our children. Thank you so much uh, for you. talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's uh, Sister Belinda Austin talking to us uh, about her experience. And um, yeah, she has the... Uh, knowledge personally, having been being a child, a long-term childhood cancer survivor herself, uh, but now working every single day to help our children. And it's people like that, teams like this with Prof. Renders doing amazing things. But, you know, as we keep on saying, um, the team is very widespread and they come from all walks of life and, and, and sometimes not just in the wards, uh, but uh, and, and other areas as well. And it's my great pleasure now to welcome uh, a chalk social worker at the uh, Pediatric Oncology Unit at the Charlotte Matleke uh, Johannesburg Academic Hospital. Now chalk has 10 uh, social and three social auxiliary workers working uh, in 11 hospitals in South Africa, providing uh, full-time uh, psychosocial emotional support for uh, from diagnosis right through uh, to the end of treatment, uh, whether cure and survivorship or sadly sometimes end of life and bereavement support. And um, one of these uh, social workers at the Pediatric Oncology Unit at the Charlotte Matleke at Johannesburg Academic Hospital is Mwetu Bell. Mwetu, thanks so much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome. Hi, Peter, and hi to the viewers. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, all of you have such important roles to play. And I just wonder, I mean, a little bit later on, we're speaking to Prof Reinders, and he spoke about the value of uh, this uh, multidisciplinary team uh, in the pediatric oncology unit. And uh, you are a social worker, uh, part of this team. What difference do you think that uh, you're able to make in this journey with uh, uh, childhood cancer? Mm. I think firstly, if you were to speak to any parents who have had their child diagnosed with cancer, uh, I'm certain most of them, they will tell you the moment the doctor shares the news that their child has cancer, the thoughts that come into their head is my child is dying or they want to know about the treatment. But apart from that, the other information that is shared afterwards is unheard or misunderstood. So as a social worker, because I'm there when the doctor breaks the news, as a social worker, days after that, I, I keep on spending time with the family just to assess their understanding of the diagnosis and the treatment plan. So if I pick up that the family or the child misunderstands something, so I try to clarify that. And if they require or they need the doctor to counsel them, to have another counseling session with them or with the other family members, then I organize that. So there's a lot of psychoeducation involved. And then secondly, what happens is South Africa is one of the low income countries. So which means most of the families, there's, they come from unemployed backgrounds and poverty is a reality to them. So I need to assess if the family is going back home, are they able to come back for the next treatment? And uh, do they have the means to do that? And if they are home, do they have food to eat? Because those things play a huge role in the child with the cancer, even though treatments might be available, but if there is no money to come to hospital, then it means the child will default from the treatment and end up dying. Or if there is no food, then so, I assist them through the CHOC uh, practical services, which is the transport assistance and the, the food parcels. And then sometimes some families stay far from the hospital. Then we're able to accommodate them in the CHOC houses. So, and I refer them to other organizations that we work with for more assistance. And you always hear from parents that, that those, yeah, those resources they are referred to make a huge difference into their lives. It brings hope and it eases the burden of having a child with cancer because they are not worried about coming to the hospital because they know that there is support available to them. And yeah, and one of the things that you have uh, as a child social worker is that the relationship doesn't end. There's no termination of relationship. From the beginning, the child, from the time the child is diagnosed with cancer, you are there with the child and with the entire family. Even when they complete treatment, you're still there. And in unfortunate cases, when the child dies, we still offer bereavement support. Like we had a patient sometime who was treated at our unit and had an opportunity to be treated at St. Jude's Hospital. The child got the treatment. However, around September last year, the child relapsed and was for end of life treatment. Even though they were in America, the mother sent me a text saying that my child has relapsed and there's no treatment available. I just wanted to inform you since you have been part of the journey. And when the child died in December, I was one of the first people to be informed about that. And I saw the mom in January in a shopping mall and we still continued. So the relationship is continuous, which is the beauty of it. It never ends, it never ends. Yeah. So I think what I have explained illustrate the kind of difference that a social worker makes in a pediatric oncology unit. All right. I mean, you, you work at, at all layers of life and we're going to talk to Her Royal Highness a little bit later on about um, equality and access because I know that that's something really important to her. But I suppose for you, uh, it is quite important to make sure that everybody has a chance to get the best help uh, and best human social support, because it's a lot more than just uh, a medical story, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I wish we had more time. I'd have so much more questions too. But 
being a human story, I just wonder how it impacts you personally uh, to be doing this kind of work and offering this kind of support. Yeah, it can be heartbreaking at times, painful, challenging, because you build relationship with the entire family. Uh, you are part of the whole process. However, I think the greatest impact it has on me, it is that of gratitude. It is that of living your life in the present because you see these children who go through so much suffering yet they go on with life. Their life continues. As Sister Belinda mentioned that they are always full of smiles and that's what you get when you go into the world. They, I think they give you the strength to carry on with the work. So I think that is the greatest impact they have on me because despite the suffering that they're going through, but they are the most resilient children. They are the most, I think, resilient people to ever see in life. They, com they don't complain about the challenges that they go through. They continue to live life. They enjoy life despite the challenges that they are faced with. Well, thank you so, so much, Mwetu. And again, thank you for the valuable work that you do. And uh, yeah, please keep soldiering on our kids and our teens. I greatly appreciated that, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Mwetu. Thank you very much, Peter. All right. Yeah, great champions, great people. And uh, you can't help but uh, get your heartstrings pulled listening to all these stories and these testimonies uh, from uh, our champions on the front line, literally uh, making a difference uh, in so many children and teens' lives. Okay, so um, again, you know, as I said, we, we, we have these champions come in, in different forms. And uh, the, the, when I first heard this word, I thought, this is interesting, uh, a chalk cow. What on earth is that, you might be wondering? Well, a chalk cow, uh, chalk cows are a group of people on a mission to make a difference uh, with children uh, with cancer and uh, uh, children, their families as well. Uh, and armed with uh, uh, the slogan, love living life, they use their lifestyle goals to raise money for chalk. And uh, we have one chalk cow right now, uh, who's better known as Derbs Daisy. And uh, she's also a ward volunteer. And I just want to say a very warm welcome to you, uh, Iris Schroeder. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. So what does the, the term mama bear mean to you? Okay, well, I am a mom of three children, and I'm sure the term mama bear is world, known worldwide. Um, you know, mom instinctively protect your children, nurture, love, care. If they ever saw you, give them a hug, etc., etc. But I'm one of the very lucky people who goes into the ward um, and interacts with the children together with a group of volunteers. And when you open that door and those children see you, they run to you as if you are their mama bear. And for two hours, we interact with these children. And as was previously said, they don't ever complain. They just want to play and the crazier, better. And they are so full of love and so full of joy that we feel as a group of volunteers, we are the mama bears because we're there to interact with them as sort of moms for the time being but they are the most uplifting little souls I've ever met in my life. Um, and then obviously we meet moms that are there with their children who are the mama bears of those children who sometimes just want to talk to us as a mom to a mom or as a volunteer to a mom about their heartache or have, have a shoulder to cry on. Um, we often, most of us don't understand all the terminology, but we just, want to listen and give them a hug and um, I think it's very important that the volunteers go to the wards just to give everybody a break even the nurses and the, the doctors. Well thank you so so much for that I mean you're a, a chalk cow which means that uh, you, you spend a lot of time and effort um, helping Chalk do the work that it does by raising funds so that it's able to offer uh, this support on so many levels. And I just wonder what, what keeps you getting on that bike and keep pedaling uh, to the finishing line to, to get this very important work done? Well, most of the Chalk Owls, I'd say all of us, we have one beautiful thing in common, and that's that we are healthy 
and we are therefore able to do these things. And what better way to challenge yourself than to do it with a, a common goal in mind, and that's to fundraise for these children. So if I can make a difference by suffering for 12 hours and make a difference to a child who's been suffering for a long time, then my 12 hours is, is absolutely nothing compared to what they go through. And I know that the whole herd of cows feels the same way. Um, we just had the Midmore Mile and we had a lot of children swimming in chalk cow print. And um, for me as a chalk cow, it's, there's nothing more inspirational than to see these young leaders putting on costumes and telling us that they're doing this because they would want those children in the war to one day also be able to put on a cow print costume and swim the mile and raise funds. So we just get driven by the children in the ward. They are, that's the common goal. That's our medal. Wow. Wow. All right. So what might be your message uh, to the public uh, who might want to make a difference in the child, uh, in, in uh, children uh, living with cancer? So, I mean, there's obviously a lot of options. Not everybody wants to get on a bicycle and do crazy things or swim or run or whatever. But if you are one of those crazy people, the beauty with the cows is we don't want you to reach the podium. We don't want you to be first. We want you to do this because you love living life and you want to raise funds. And when you raise funds, you get beautiful cow print kits. Um, but also people that might want to raise funds by knitting or baking or whatever, whatever, there's no nothing that you can't do. If you can raise funds, you can become a volunteer and you join CHOC. There are lots of ways of looking on, um, finding out how to go about this. And if you visit the CHOC website, you, um, there are lots of ways to become a volunteer. And every little cent and every little effort makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Absolutely. And there's, never, uh, there's never enough money. I got an envelope full of copper coins the other day, which was, I don't know, it weighed a ton, but it was probably all of seven rand from a little seven-year-old. And very proud, please can you give this to the children in the ward? And that's, that's why I do what I do. Oh. Iris, thank you so much for being an amazing mama bear, a, a wonderful chalk cow. Uh, please keep fighting the good fight. Thank you. Thank you so much for your story. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Wow. Ah, God, you know, I'm always uh, on the verge of tears when we have these conversations, just hearing these powerful testimonies and the motivation uh, that uh, keeps people uh, in the trenches, on the front lines, uh, uh, helping our children and our teens uh, go through these difficult journeys. And uh, we're really, really grateful to have special human beings like you, uh, part of these amazing teams on different layers, different levels and different places, uh, all doing the same work. And that's uh, uh, fighting for our children and their families. Okay, so uh, one person who really has been a champion now for, for decades uh, in this arena is uh, our very special guest today. But to tell you a little bit more about her before we talk to her is uh, the Chalk Board Chairperson. And uh, to introduce her and to say hello and welcome, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome to you Eugene Suman. Thank you, Peter. Uh... Thank you, everybody. Welcome. It is my privilege to welcome the Royal Highness Princess Dina Murad of Jordan as our keynote speaker. We are honored that you could join us in celebrating International Childhood Cancer Day. The Royal Highness Princess Dina is the immediate past president for the Union of International Cancer Control, former director of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation, honorary ambassador of Harvard Global Health win-win initiative, honorary president of European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, special envoy for NCDs for Vital Strategies, member of WHO expert group for the elimination of cervical cancer, member of the United Nations University, UNU, high level advis advisory committee for gender and health hub, but most importantly, she is the patron of International Society for Pediatric Oncology, SIO, 
and has a heart for children with cancer. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much uh, indeed. Uh, and it's such a great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Princess Dina. Thank you so much uh, for giving us your time. And I know that there are so many people around the world uh, that uh, through your work and uh, uh, um, your causing, uh, your championship of this cause, um, need your time and, and your thoughts. But thank you for giving us uh, this time today. Um, and I suppose in many ways, um, God works in, in powerful ways, doesn't he? That he uh, perhaps presents a set of circumstances and through those circumstances, you find a cause and you find uh, a purpose. Uh, has that been your journey? Is this how you got into this world of helping our children uh, and families fight cancer? Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Um, you are absolutely right. You know, actually from all the list of credentials that you've just read about me, probably the most important title is the fact that I'm a mother of a cancer survivor. And this is the most important title uh, for me. And so for me to attend this uh, webinar, it's actually an honor that I can be, join you. This is, there's nothing more important than keep talking and about childhood cancer and sharing one's story, whoever you, uh, you know, whoever one can be, because as you know, you know, cancer is a great leveler, isn't it? It affects everyone. Uh, you know, male, female, rich, poor, old, young. And so we all have a, sh a, a story to share. And yes, um, before that, you know, in, in 1997, before my child was diagnosed with cancer, Rakan, uh, you know, there was no, I was a young mom and uh, cancer was so not in uh, my landscape. And certainly it wasn't in the landscape of many people, at least in Jordan in those days, in 1997. You know, nobody spoke about the word cancer. Um, uh, even if they would speak about it and you would hear about it very rarely, it would be, you wouldn't mention it by name. You would say that disease. There was a lot of stigma around cancer. And so when our child, you know, we happened to be in England at the time because my husband was doing his uh, PhD in Cambridge as a young family. We went with him. And at that time I had my daughter who was, Shireen was four years old and our son, you know, uh, not yet two years old. And uh, he got diagnosed uh, with ALL uh, leukemia in England. And even in England at the time, for me to get him diagnosed, uh, I had gone countless of times to the emergency room. And every time they told me it's the flu. And that was in England even. General pra doctors, practitioners, also did not receive the memo then. Uh, they did not have the same aware. I did I certainly didn't have any uh, awareness about cancer at all because nobody spoke about it. The general doctors at the National Health Service in England certainly didn't because I went 10 times. But then I had mother's instinct. And I, th I tell you all, this is real. It's so medical. Mother's instinct knows something is serious. Uh, even though I didn't think about cancer, finally, I called my pediatrician back home and I said, I literally wrote down every single symptom of leukemia without knowing it's leukemia. It's crazy. I still have the memo to this day. And uh, that's when he told me, go and get a blood test. So I went back to the National Health Service in England. You know, it, I'm not used to it there. And then I said, look, I just want a blood test. I'm ready to pay for it. And this is by that time, actually, with the naked eye, the doctor finally looked at our Sandra Kant's legs and she could see all the bruises. And she said, I believe you need to go to the emergency. So had I not uh, insisted and felt that there's something serious, you know, and not, you know, we would have missed our chance. And that's how I entered the world of cancer because after getting top treatment in England and later on in um, the US because he did bone marrow, bone marrow transplant after that and so on, I understood that when I came back home, 
I needed to join the team here to change the narrative of cancer care in Jordan. Because at that time, there was no, the, you know, when I came back in 2002, there was a newly built hospital, didn't even have the name cancer on it. It was called the Hope Center, but it gave no hope. So it was still perpetuating the stigma and so on. And that's how I entered and I became the director director of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation and uh, started the journey, you know, sharing my story, doing fundraising. I was the CEO. I was there every day. It was hard at first to go back to the pediatric, you know, rooms, but it was also therapy. And thankfully me and the team at the center, at the board, etc. collectively, we managed to change the narrative of cancer care in our country to to what is now the King Hussein Cancer Center, one of the best cancer centers in the region. Yeah, but changing the narrative was just one part of the story. And I know that um, one of the things that uh, is very important to you uh, and, and to developing nations in general is access and quality care for all, isn't it? And I suppose uh, the story of Jordan it, it has helped you tell that story to the world. Yes, because if you think about it, Peter, I mean, I know you hear about this sort of very academic term, access to care. But what does it really mean? It means it's exactly what I experienced in Jordan when I was director. You get somebody with a child looking at you in the face. I, I remember this Yemeni girl looking at me with her beautiful big, big brown eyes as if to say, you know, are you going to treat me or not? Are you, are, or are you going to le leave me to die, right? So access, lack of access to care is literally that. You're kind of saying to somebody, listen, the medical cure is there, but so sorry, it's not for you. So it is real, it is serious. But, you know, having traveled the world, being ex-president of the uh, Union for International Cancer Control, it really is... Uh, access to care, of course, is more complicated than just finding a medical facility to treat you. It's the finances. Are you covered or not? You know, it's catastrophic expenses for cancer if you have to pay for that. Then, of course, you've got if you live far away, like somebody uh, earlier said, um, one of the social workers here at this webinar, transport. I remember the our foundation covering one child for $100,000 for leukemia treatment. But then this child suddenly disappeared. Why? Because he didn't have the taxi fare to come to and fro to the center. So that's when we started our transport support program. Again, we've had some children, they didn't even have a fridge. We had to buy them a fridge to put their chemo medications and so on. So you've got poverty as an obstacle. You've got geography. You've got lack of information. Like we said, I mean, I my child might not have made it because A, I didn't know the early signs. It's very important to know the early signs of cancer. I didn't, the doctors didn't know that at that time, even in England. Uh, so lack of information is when um, not presenting early, yeah, early detections, as some other people said, early detection is key. Um, and so many other things, and stigma, you know, the role of stigma. I remember, you know, when people heard that of my child had leukemia, they said, oh, you know, she's young, she can have another child. Immediately they equated cancer with death. And, you know, stigma is real because stigma I equated with fear, with denial, with silence, and it's all and shame, and it all leads to people presenting too late. You know, when the cancer has really, you know, got hold of your body. So, um, yeah, so access to care is a lot of things. Um, I keep comparing Jordan because uh, in many respects, um, Africa as a developing continent, developing issues, we deal with the same challenges and, and, and um, some of the same issues. And one of the ones I'd like to explore is traditional healing. Uh, is that something that you find common in Jordan? Because we see it a lot here. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about yeah, traditional we do we do have that. We, we, we do believe in our herbs. We do that, you know. If you have a stomach uh, upset, we have fresh herbs to deal with that. And, and they are good. 
uh, and we've had patients uh, really relying on that. But what we tell them, so it is an issue. What we tell them is it's great. A lot of traditional hearing is actually supportive to the care. It's not instead of the chemo, unfortunately, but you people forget that herbs and plants or whatever it is, they are, they are the stuff that med meds are made from. And so the doctors need to know what you are thinking of so that it doesn't counteract with the actual medication. I remember when I, my son had his protocol for treatment, they told me don't drink orange juice. Why? Because vitamin C can cancel the work of one of the chemotherapy agents. So we really try to explain that. If you are thinking of that, it can be supportive, but tell your doctor first. Otherwise, it might cancel something or horribly give you a side effect. All right. You, as a former president of the UICC, you've seen uh, this fight uh, from a global scale. Uh, each story is individual and unique, um, but there is a global story that's playing out. I just wonder what you find as the um, uh, common global challenges that we need to work together to overcome uh, to better help our children and their families. Well, number one, you know, um, unfortunately, I mean, I understand in South Africa, at least the children are covered, right? They are covered, whether in public or private hospitals. That's amazing. Uh, throughout the globe, I have visited many countries whose children are absolutely not covered for cancer. So the definite, you know, thing that is in common is people who are covered and people who are not. Those who are not, they simply die. I mean, and I visited some other countries in Africa where the cure rate for ALL leukemia, for example, is only 20%, if that. I mean, that's tantamount to saying the child is dying. Whereas you and I know, you know, elsewhere, and even I hear in South Africa, you reach about 85, 80 to 85%, which is great. Other countries, maybe 90 to 95. You're quite close. So that's lucky. Definitely stigma is very common, like I said, different cultures, different beliefs, uh, you know, and it all stems of fear. And then that fear leads to, into something else. People, you know, uh, thinking it's some countries still think cancer is contagious. Some countries still think, you know, uh, all kinds of things. But poverty is an obstacle, like I said, geography. Um, um, uh, but a lot more, I would say, if you are not covered financially, that's the biggest thing. Or if you don't even have a cancer center. Imagine I visited some countries in Africa who have just acquired their first ever uh, radiotherapy machine to cover 40 million people. So that's real when you don't have the infrastructure. But I also want to say here, the stigma really was also global in a sense. Um, the fact that the UN only acknowledged cancer and non-communicable diseases only in September 2011. And that's why many countries in low middle income countries have delayed in building the infrastructure for cancer at all levels, whether having you know, the healthcare workforce, the machinery, the buildings, uh, et cetera. And that's because they thought low middle income countries are only busy with infectious diseases, as opposed to uh, also non-communicable disease like cancer, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there is a blame for that. And, that's, and all the donors, you know, big uh, global donors followed that as well. And that was, there was a delay where I see, but we can do better. And, and, and I, I'm so glad that South Africa is doing, uh, it's on the road to doing better, working on early detection, working on information, um, you know, getting people to be aware, to present themselves, etc. You're luckier than most for sure. Uh, Princess Dina, perhaps as a, as a final thought, uh, today we're celebrating uh, the heroes, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the fundraisers, and all the people in this chain uh, that are helping our children and our teens. Um, what would your message be uh, to all of these heroes and these different walks uh, uh, in this fight? Yeah. You know, when our child was sick, of course, we felt shock, worry, we felt overwhelmed, and most 
Uh, and of course, we felt alone, you know, in this big thing that, uh, you know, we felt we have lost control uh, and worried that we're going to lose our most precious. But what you suddenly have is this new instant family, you know, and, and a great family because you don't have dynamics with this family. <laughs> this family is only there to help you, ready to lift you up and carry you through the long and arduous journey of cancer treatment. And I tell you, we would not have been able to stay sane and I really say that, without the support of the lovely nurses, the doctors, the volunteers, the play therapists, the pharmacist who smiled at us when he gave us the medication, the, the lady in the shop in the hospital who gave lollipop to our son with a big smile, everybody, the social workers, because truly it was through your hands that we were able to sustain hope and achieve the maximum potential of our treatment. Big heartfelt thank you, really from the heart. Without you, we wouldn't have been able, you know, to maintain hope and, and to continue uh, with our journey. Well, we thank you, uh, Your Royal Highness, Princess Dina Mirad from Jordan. I uh, thank you so much for the work not, you've done, not just in Jordan, but globally uh, to help our children and our teens and their families. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your message. Uh, we really, really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you Peter, thank you. All right, thank you so much. That was Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mirad from Jordan. Um, powerful, powerful story, amazing woman uh, who herself, uh, the mother of a childhood cancer uh, a survivor and has spent years and years on the front line doing amazing work, not just in her home country, Jordan, but uh, across the world as well. Such a privilege to have her with us today. All right, so we're starting to wrap things up on this webinar. I hope that uh, the journey so far has been a good one, uh, a valuable and enriching one. And uh, uh, to give us uh, some final thoughts and perhaps to say a few words of thanks, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome our CEO at the Ch Childhood Cancer Foundation, uh, Hedley Lewis. Hedley? Oh, Peter, thanks so much. Chalk Childhood Cancer's tagline is keeping more than hope alive. And this is evidence of how we augment the medical fraternity in South Africa. As the anchor organization for Childhood Cancer International, we work closely with our sister organizations, both in South Africa, globally, and across the board. It takes global childhood cancer communities to ensure that there is a cure for all and hope. I'd like to extend obviously a heartfelt thank you to everyone that has partnered with us for this incredible webinar. Her Royal Highness Princess Dina, from across the globe, we've heard your words. They've resonated with us and they continue and hopefully will resonate globally with policymakers, with individuals, and with those that need that comfort. Prof Reinders, you're a sterling example showcasing that South Africa has skill, that has those individuals that doesn't just have the skill to treat, but has the heart and passion to be by the sides of these families and their children. When we look at the likes of Sister Belinda, or where to, as well as Iris, who are there side by side with these families, we can only feel humbled that there are individuals that truly create this global environment of care and love for these families. I can only thank the individual and an individual that I often will say has been in my family's TV rooms for many decades, none other than Peter. Thank you very much, sir, for uniting the voices, from bringing Her Royal Highness all the way from Jordan to South African voices all together. I think that the choir is spoken and the one song that will continue to speak and sing is that of we need to continue to create hope and be by the sides of those that need it. The technical team, once again, a special thank you. It is absolutely essential that our words, our voices are heard. And today, what better way than using technology such as this with experts that really make it absolutely 
a pleasure to have united individuals of this caliber, this oak, but most importantly, the, the love and the passion. And finally, this is just one of many webinars that's happening this year. And we urge individuals across the globe within our country to once again join in and hear the voices of the specialists, the voices of the mummers, the voices which is gonna be the next one of the survivors. So we look forward to every one of you joining us on the 9th of March. Thank you, Hedley. Thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, as you said, uh, great uh, to have so many people in this room today uh, from all over the world. And uh, we look forward to the next one. And uh, not to forget today is a very, very important day, International Childhood Cancer Day. And the theme is better survival is achievable. And I just want us to think about that, not just for today, uh, but throughout the whole year, because that's what really this fight is all about. Um, early detection, the magic bullet that really is the, the big game changer. So we've got to get out there, uh, keep on doing this work. And to you, our heroes, our champions that are doing amazing work every single day, do not tire. Sometimes you might not get recognized and might not get the thank yous, but uh, you are making a huge, huge difference. And so we thank you for the work that you do on the various platforms and in the different ways. So from all of us here at the uh, CHOC uh, uh, Foundation webinar, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for clicking through. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.